Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, so this is our public uh, lecture and stargazing event for the beginning of March. These are uh, my name is Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at Caltech in the astronomy department, and I also organize these events. Uh, thank you for coming out and braving the the bad weather. This is our third month of cloudy weather in a row after three years of clear weather. So definitely an anomaly. Uh, this is one of our public lectures that we have. We have these roughly once a month, um, and the schedule is available up at the door. Uh, and I say roughly once a month because our next event will be in two weeks, being given by a somewhat famous astronomer named Mike Brown, also known as Pluto Killer, because he's partially responsible for the, well, he, he, he says he's mostly responsible for the demotion of Pluto from planet to dwarf planet. So I fully expect there to be protest signs and such next time. But uh, in addition to our public lecture series, we also have informal events at a bar called Astronomy on Tap, which is at a bar in Old Town, Pasadena, with two 15-minute informal talks on some astronomical topic. The next one is March 25th. It'll be on black holes, mostly. Uh, those are also free. Despite it being at a bar, they are welcome to, uh, to have children at them. Of course, the children can't drink beer. Uh, but, but you are all welcome to do so. Um, as you probably could see, we, we, uh, we have clouds, so we won't be able to observe, but following the 30-minute lecture that Elliot will give, uh, we'll set up a table up here and have members of our department in various different specialties answering questions from the audience on any topic related to space science or astronomy or physics. So you're encouraged to stick around. Uh, we'll do that until 9 o'clock and you can ask whatever cosmic questions that you may have. Um, in terms of other announcements, oh, we, we, we just finished posting all of our lectures from the last three years uh, to YouTube. Uh, the, the efforts of Mike Jang, raise your hand, Mike Jang. Um, he, he uploaded many of these uh, lectures. Yeah, thank you, Mike. So now if you miss a lecture or you just want to go relive that th thrilling experience of being at a lecture, you can log into YouTube and search for Caltech Astronomy and, and it'll pop up. Uh, one more announcement. We had our first foreign language event this week. We had Astronomy on Tap entirely in Spanish. Uh, it, was, it was very successful and so we hope to have at least a couple of events. Oh, Luis Masribas was one of our speakers. Um, we, we hope to have a variety of events offered in foreign languages, first with Spanish, then we may try Mandarin and some other languages that, that people nominally speak, both in the department as well as the community. Uh, yeah, so our speaker for tonight, um, I'm very pleased to announce, is a visiting professor. He's a professor at UC Berkeley. He is visiting us because he's on sabbatical, which is nominally vacation for a professor, uh, where you get to get work done and don't get bothered by your students. So he's down here for three months, and then we'll be going to Princeton for the remainder of the term. So Dr. Elliot Quadert got his undergrad at MIT, his PhD at Harvard. He did a postdoctoral research position at the Institute for Advanced Study, which is the institution that Einstein helped start um, on Princeton's campus. And he's been a professor at UC Berkeley since 2001. And I personally think that Elliot is one of the smartest theoretical astrophysics in the, in the field right now. Um, and I, I'm really, really happy to have him here uh, talking to us about uh, the creation of elements in binary neutron star mergers. So please welcome Dr. Elliot Quadr. Thanks very much, Cameron. It's great to be here. Um, so as Cameron mentioned, sabbatical is something we get to do once every seven or eight years, where basically Berkeley pays me to go somewhere else uh, and tells me I'm not responsible for doing any of, the, any of the things I normally do at Berkeley and can basically do whatever I want. So it's been great to be here uh, focusing on research, thinking about different things. So I'm a theoretical astrophysicist, which means I'm very happy it's cloudy. So I didn't have to embarrass myself by uh, showing you that I don't know how to use a telescope. <laughs> um, instead, I do calculations, both pencil and paper, computers, calculators, et cetera, and use those calculations to try to interpret observations and make 
predictions for uh, new phenomena that can be observed. And that'll come back uh, as we go through the talk tonight. So what I want to tell you about is sort of an amazing discovery story that unites two not very obviously related questions, which is what happens if you build a new telescope that sees not light, what our eye can see, but sees waves associated with gravity. That's the telescope here. Uh, and another question, which is where in the universe are many of the elements in nature produced? In particular, it turns out things like gold, platinum, uranium, berkelium. Unfortunately, there's not a pasadenium, so I st stuck with my, my berkelium. So I want to start by taking you back to high school chemistry. Um, so I'm a physicist. I actually did poorly in chemistry, both in college uh, and in high school, it was too much memorization for me. Uh, but uh, what we've learned, uh, certainly historically from chemistry, is that almost everything here on Earth is built from a few relatively simple number of building blocks. In chemistry, we organize those building blocks into the periodic table, hydrogen, helium, Lithium, beryllium, carbon, iron, oxygen, gold, unanilium, things like that. Um, in physics, we break these down even more. We say that hydrogen is made out of protons and electrons. Helium is made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons, et cetera. Uh, that detail of how things are broken down even more isn't going to be super crucial uh, for what we talk about, but I will come back to that uh, a little bit later. One of the great triumphs in astronomy and physics is that we actually have a pretty good understanding about where in the universe these building blocks originated. We don't think that the universe started off with all of these building blocks, but they were actually formed in different places and in different times through specific phenomena uh, out there in the universe. And the broad picture that we've learned over the last century is that the lightest elements, so hydrogen that's in the water that we drink, helium and lithium, those were actually produced in the first three minutes of the expansion of the universe, in the earliest stages of what we call the Big Bang. But everything else, uh, the oxygen that we breathe, the iron in our bloods, the carbon in our bones, uh, the gold on our fingers, right? All of those elements were actually created by processes in stars or stellar explosions. So stars and stellar explosions are basically little nuclear furnaces uh, that build up more complicated elements like carbon and oxygen and iron and gold from simpler elements like hydrogen and helium. So this is essentially the alchemy that the Greeks were looking for actually takes place in stellar interiors where the temperatures are very high and the conditions are much more extreme than we find here on Earth. So although this broad picture we think we understand, there's been a not small part of that story that's actually still been uh, missing from our understanding. And that has to do with where the heaviest elements, or where many of the heaviest elements in the periodic table are produced. Uh, in particular, things like platinum, uranium, and gold, uh, and things that are called the rare earth elements, which, uh, although you don't probably know many of their names, yttrium, europium, dystopium, terbium, Neodymium, they're actually extremely important for technology. Uh, your iPhones rely uh, critically on many of these so-called rare earth elements. Uh, and we haven't understood where in the universe these elements are produced. What distinguishes these from the ones that we understand is these are made mostly of neutrons, it turns out. They have more neutrons than protons in the atomic nucleus. And what's amazing is that this puzzle uh, of where these unusual heavy elements were produced, this was actually solved, or more precisely, uh, our best understanding of it to date, uh, was made by a telescope that doesn't detect light, but instead detects a different kind of wave, what are called gravitational waves. 
So I want to remind you that light comes in many different forms. So when you go to a dentist and they take an x-ray of your skull and you see a picture of your cavities, right? Those x-rays are a form of light. There's light that we see with our eyes. There's radio waves that your uh, car picks up. Those are all different kinds of light. So from a physics point of view, those are basically the same thing. And the only difference is what kind of light it is. In particular, how often in time or space a pattern, a wave of electricity repeats itself. Radio waves, the pattern takes a very long time to repeat. X-rays, the pattern repeats very rapidly. The waves we're going to really be talking about initially in this talk are not waves associated with light or waves associated with electricity. They're waves associated with gravity. So imagine you have a situation like this. This could be the Earth going around the sun. It could be two stars orbiting around each other. It could be two black holes orbiting around each other. As these two objects go around, gravity is changing because where the two objects are is moving. So gravity is changing in time as these two objects go around. And that information that gravity is changing, that information gets communicated out into space by a wave a wave that's only associated with gravity. So you can think of this as a wave that communicates to the rest of the universe that gravity is changing in space and time because these two objects are undergoing this gravitational dance around each other. These gravitational waves in more detail were predicted by Einstein as part of his theory of what's called general relativity. This is our modern understanding of gravity. Uh, it involves the notion that space and time are actually dynamic entities. So you'll often see gravitational waves described as ripples in space-time, which is meant to convey the idea that gravity is associated with the structure of space. Gravity is changing as these objects go around each other, and so the very structure of space is changing, and that change is communicated out in the form of a wave. And the way to visualize what does this mean, this is a computer simulation of one of these gravitational waves, the way to think about this is that there are regions here where gravity is a little bit stronger, regions where gravity is a little weaker, a little stronger, a little weaker, and that's a wave of changing gravity going out into space. So the initial idea of gravitational waves was developed in the early 1900s. It took actually until the 1960s, due in no large part to Kip Thorne here at Caltech and many of his collaborators and students, until gravitational waves were really understood mathematically. The math is rather complicated. Uh, and it took yet longer for people to realize that you might actually be able to detect these waves. And to detect gravitational waves, what you want is, as you might envision from this animation, is you want objects that have really strong gravity that are moving around each other really fast. Because then gravity is strong, and it's changing in time really fast. And that gives you a big signal in these gravitational waves. So what are the strongest sources of gravity that we know of in the universe? It turns out they're not anything from our everyday experience. It's not the Earth. It's not the Sun. It's not Jupiter. It's not even Pluto. Apologies to Mike Brown. Uh, instead, it's actually much more exotic objects. The strongest sources of gravity that we know of in the universe are two types of stars, stars sort of in quotes, because they're sort of like the sun in some ways and not like the sun in other ways. Uh, one, a black hole, and the other called a neutron star. So first, a neutron star. So neutron stars are stars that have masses similar to the mass of the sun and sizes comparable to the size of a city, even a big city like Los Angeles. So envision taking the sun, which is enormous in size compared to the Earth, and squishing it down until it had a size about the size of a city. That star would be like a neutron star. And during that process of squishing it down, actually, the sun would get converted from mostly protons and electrons to mostly neutrons. That what, that's what happens when you have so much mass in such a small region. So very small star, huge amount of mass, very small radius, mostly made of neutrons. 
And because the radius is small, gravity is very strong. Right? Gravity gets stronger if the mass of the object is bigger, the sun's gravity is bigger than Jupiter's gravity, or if the object is very small, two things are close to each other, gravity gets stronger. So these very small stars have enormously strong gravitational pull. Uh, the other stars that are important for gravitational waves are black holes. I didn't think I needed to put artist's conception because it's probably pretty clear that these are not real pictures of black holes. This one is uh, my favorite. So if you Google black hole, there's like a graphic novel about really disaffected, uh, alienated teenagers that turn into zombies. Uh, and <laughs> it has something to do with black holes, evidently. Um, these are, are even more unusual stars than neutron stars. These are really stars where gravity has won out over everything else in the universe and caused all of the mass that was otherwise in the star to collapse down to a point. So gravity really in black holes has won out over what's keeping the Earth from collapsing in, what's keeping the sun from collapsing in, what's keeping a neutron star from collapsing in. Gravity has won. The mass collapses down to the very center, and we're left with an object that's basically just pure gravity, pure gravity. And because these are the smallest objects we know of of a given mass, they're the strongest sources of gravity that we know of in the universe. So how do you make a strong source of gravitational waves? Well, you want gravity to be changing in time. So what you want is either two black holes to be near each other going around, two neutron stars to be near each other going around, or a neutron star and a black hole to be near each other going around. And so this shows a computer simulation of that process. This is a computer simulation that solves Einstein's equations of gravity. These are two black holes going around each other. As time goes on, the two black holes get closer and closer to each other. Eventually, they collide, forming a new black hole at the center of the system. Okay, I'll show this again. This shows, so yellow and, red and blue here are again meant to represent strong gravity, weak gravity, strong gravity, weak gravity. This is that wave of changing gravity, these gravitational waves going out into space. This is another way of looking at what's going on. As time goes on, this represents the signal. How strong is that wave of gravity? It gets stronger as time goes on because the two black holes get closer to each other, so gravity gets stronger. The other thing you'll notice is that the distance between the peaks of strong gravity and the troughs of weaker gravity get closer together as time goes on. And that's because when the two black holes are closer to each other, they orbit around each other faster. Mercury, closer to the sun, orbits the sun faster than the Earth. Jupiter, further away from the sun, orbits the sun slower than the Earth. And so that's what you're seeing here. Stronger gravity as things get closer together, and then things move around each other faster as they get closer together. This is the telescope that detected gravitational waves starting just a few years ago. It was a telescope actually built and conceived uh, largely out of MIT and Caltech. Um, it's a heroic effort uh, by many thousands of people uh, to make this telescope work. It probably doesn't look like a telescope you're used to. This is not the kind of telescope we would have used tonight had, had, there, had it not been cloudy. These are actually lasers bouncing light back and forth between these many mile long arms. There are mirrors at each end. As the light bounces back and forth between the mirrors, when one of these gravitational waves goes by, it causes the mirrors to move a little bit. And you can use the light bouncing back and forth between the mirrors to measure the distance between the mirrors extremely accurately. It's an extraordinarily difficult measurement. And I've told you basically everything I know about how this telescope works, because remember, I'm a theorist. But I think this is widely agreed among the physics community to be probably the hardest experiment ever done in the history of physics to date. To give you an idea of how impressive this is, the distance, distances between the mirrors are measured to an accuracy that's equivalent to measuring the distance to the nearest star to the Earth, other than the Sun, which is Proxima Centauri. 
It's a few light years away. So imagine you could measure the distance to that star with an accuracy that's better than the width of a human hair. Okay. That's how accurately they've measured the distances between the mirrors. Really an amazing experimental achievement. So what did they see? Well, when the telescope turned on in 2015, uh, they detected actually within the first week of turning it on. This was an amazing, uh, amazing result. They detected the collision of two 30 solar mass black holes. This is an artist's conception of what that collision looked like. Far apart, spiral together, new black hole left over after the collision. This shows the actual data. There's two of these telescopes, one in Washington, state of Washington, one in the state of Louisiana. And this shows basically the distance between the mirrors as a function of time. The total time here is about less than about a second. Okay, and what I want you to see in this pattern is exactly what was in the computer simulation. As time goes on, the signal gets stronger, the two black holes get closer. As time goes on, the distance between the peaks and the troughs gets shorter. As the black holes get closer, they orbit faster, so things get shrunk down in time. So this is an amazing result. Uh, it is the best evidence yet that black holes exist with the properties predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's our best test in many ways of general relativity under the extreme conditions appropriate for black holes. Uh, Barry Barish and Kip Thorne here uh, and Ray Weiss at MIT won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017 for this uh, discovery. LIGO has detected uh, about 10 or so colliding black holes now. There's a tremendous amount of interesting science that's still being done with those. Uh, but I'm going to focus instead on the collision between two neutron stars that would, was detected on August 17th, 2017. So a few years after the collision between two black holes, LIGO collect, detected the collision between two neutron stars. And the basic thing that LIGO saw was the same as here, okay, just not quite as impressive. Neutron stars are a little lighter than black holes, so the signal's a little weaker and harder to see with your eye. The community, the community of people doing astronomy and physics of this type, was really, really hoping that LIGO would see not just collisions between black holes, but also collisions between two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole. And the reason is that the collisions between two black holes basically just involves gravity. And there's no way we know of, or no generic way we know of, for collisions between two black holes to produce light that you could see with all the other telescopes that have ever been built in the history of astronomy. But neutron stars involve normal matter, sort of weird normal matter, very dense, mostly neutrons, but that's still basically the building blocks of matter here on Earth. Okay. So there's at least a chance that the collision of two neutron stars would shine in normal light, not just in gravitational waves. And so the community was really, really excited about this prospect of LIGO detecting two neutron stars, two neutron stars colliding. And indeed, at exactly the place on the sky where LIGO saw the two neutron stars collide, and at the time that two, the two neutron stars collided, as seen by the gravitational wave telescope, a new source of light appeared and then disappeared. So this shows you a picture. This is the galaxy that the colliding neutron star happened in. The little smudge there okay, at sort of the intersection of those lines that's gone there, that's a new source of light associated with the collision of two neutrons. This is about a day or so after the gravitational wave signal was detected, and this is a few weeks later when that new source of light has disappeared. This particular picture is taken with what is called an infrared detector, an infrared telescope. That's light that you can't quite see with your eyes. It's a little redder than what you can see with your eyes. But in fact, 
uh, almost every telescope on Earth and almost every telescope in space looked at this place in the sky, and a large fraction of them uh, detected light associated with this collision between two neutron stars. So light from the colliding neutron stars was seen in the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the X-ray part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the optical, the stuff you see with your eyes, gamma rays, essentially across the entire span of all kinds of light, we saw light from the colliding neutron star. Telescopes are on every continent on Earth, including Antarctica, and all you know, telescopes on every continent detected this event, and something like a third of all the astronomers uh, doing professional research in the world were involved in, discover in studying these colliding neutron stars. And I think it's fair to say that this will go down as one of the most important uh, events in the history of astronomy because it provided the first time that we had a view of the same object in both gravitational waves and light. So I want to give you a feel of what does it mean for a third of the world's astronomers to be studying the same event. So when I go, or when any of us who are doing research, when we go to read a scientific paper, we often go to this website that's called NASA's Astrono Astronomical Data Systems. It basically is just a collection online of all the journal articles uh, in the literature. And you can go and download PDF files of papers. And papers usually come in different lengths. Some of them are shorter. Some of them are longer. The really exciting results that you want to get out to the rest of the community very quickly are published as what's called a letter. And what a letter is basically is that it's short. Okay, So it doesn't take you that long to write, and it doesn't take people very long to read it. So letters are usually four or five pages long because you condense all the information down in a really succinct form so that your colleagues can find out this really cool new discovery very quickly. So this is one of the letters associated with this LIGO discovery of colliding neutron stars, and it's 109 pages long. So why is it 109 pages long? It's 109 pages long, not of science. There is, in fact, four or five pages of science. There's 104 pages of author names, <laughs> university names that the authors are associated with, and acknowledgments, thank yous, to all the sources of funding at all those universities that all of those authors are associated with. So what it means then for uh, a third of the world's astronomers to be involved in studying event is that a four-page paper becomes a 109-page paper. It's really extraordinary. In fact, there was so much confusion that two of my colleagues and friends, their names show up twice in the author list. So Dan Kaysen shows up two times. There's only one Dan Kaysen, okay? Uh, but there, nobody actually went through and read all of the names of all of the 3,000 authors on the list uh, to make sure that the name didn't show up twice. Okay, so back to the science. What produces this light? Okay. What is this new source of light, and what does it tell us? So it turns out that the different light that we saw, the radio, the infrared, the optical, the x-rays, the gamma rays, those all give us different information about what happened. And I'm going to focus on the light that's similar to the light that our eye can see, so optical light or infrared light, uh, because in some ways that actually contains the richest, most detailed information about this event. So the way that we think the optical and infrared light that's seen uh, soon after the collision between the two neutron stars was produced is that during the collision of the two neutron stars, most of the stuff in the neutron stars actually ended up forming a new object at the center of the system that's almost certainly, although not certainly, it's almost certainly a black hole. What it could be is just a bigger neutron star, but we think probably it formed a black hole. But during the collision of the two neutron stars, not all of the matter ended up in the new black hole at the center. Some of the matter was flung off into space. The matter that was flung off into space was mostly neutrons, but not all neutrons. A few electrons and protons were around. 
As that matter expanded out into space and cooled, it started to fuse. So what can you make if you start with mostly neutrons and a few electrons and protons? The answer is you make those unusual, very heavy elements in the periodic table that are made mostly of neutrons with comparably few electrons and protons. Things like gold, platinum, berkelium, californium, yttrium, neodymium, all those good things. So what we think happened then is neutron star debris was flung out into space during the collision. That material, as it flung out into space, turned into these very heavy elements. Many of those heavy elements that were initially created were actually radioactively unstable. And so they started to decay and eventually formed the gold that we know and love, which can live for billions of years. So this cloud of expanding neutron star debris was basically like a radioactive cloud where it was constantly kept hot, just like a nuclear reactor is kept hot by nuclear reactions, fission reactions that go on in the reactor. So we think what ultimately produced the light that we saw associated with the neutron star merger collision is actually a direct signature that that event made gold, platinum, berkelium, yttrium, et cetera. And we can use some of the properties of the light that were observed. How long did it take the light to rise, to brighten, and then fade away? That was different, it turned out, in the infrared, the red light, and the blue light that you could see with your eyes. So in the details of how the light evolved in time and how bright it was, we can figure out information about the elements that were actually formed during the collision. And what we think is that this one collision between two neutron stars flung out into space an amount of mass of order 100 times the mass of the Earth in gold, 100 times the mass of the Earth in platinum, several times the mass of the moon in Californium and Berkelium and more exotic elements like that. And we think that collisions between neutron stars probably happen something like once every 10,000 years in a galaxy like our own, maybe once every 100,000 years. If each of those collision produces this much gold, this much platinum, this much of all these elements, then this could easily be the primary way in the universe that these elements are created. OK. So I've highlighted this story as a story of observational discovery. But I want to give you a slightly different perspective on this particular discovery uh, that I think is a better reflection of often how science actually proceeds. It turns out that the amount of light, infrared light, optical light, uh, that should be associated with colliding neutron stars was actually predicted in 2010, well before these observations were made. So seven years before the observations were made, theorists had made predictions of what would it actually look like if two neutron stars collided and flung some stuff on into space, blah, 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 right? We had done those calculations and determined exactly how bright it would be, what kind of light it would produce, how long it would last, et cetera. And if people are interested, I can explain why these calculations were done. The red line here is actually the prediction from the original 2010 paper that my then graduate student Brian Metzger did when we made these original predictions. And the blue points are the observations associated with the colliding neutron star that was detected in 2017. So this is actually a case where the theoretical predictions of what the phenomena should look like were actually there before the observational discoveries were made. So when the observations were made, because there were already theoretical predictions in place of what it should look like, it meant that it was possible to have a much more sophisticated, detailed, richer interpretation of the observations than would have been possible if the theoretical predictions actually hadn't been made. So that's true not only of the light, but also of the gravitational waves. 
the way we knew that the gravitational waves were either colliding black holes or colliding neutron stars is because theorists had predicted what the gravitational wave signal of colliding neutron stars or colliding black holes would look like. So this interplay between observational developments, experimental developments, and theoretical developments is really a critical part of how the scientific process works and how the field progresses. And that back and forth between observations and theory is certainly one of the things that I find the most fun about the kinds of science uh, that I do. So I want to end just by giving you a slightly broader perspective on what we've learned from this one event. So Carl Sagan famously said that we are all star stuff. And what he meant by that is that Again, the carbon in our bones, the oxygen we breathe, the iron in our blood, those elements were created in stellar interiors where the temperatures are very high, where nuclear fusion builds up complicated things, complicated elements out of light elements. Those heavy elements, oxygen, carbon, iron, etc., were then spewed out into space in explosions and winds, that debris gets collected in gas clouds. Those gas clouds collapse by gravity to form new stars and new planets. So the carbon in our bodies was created in some star billions of billions of years ago, ended up in a cloud of gas, which eventually collapsed to form the sun four and a half billion years ago. What we now know is that literally in every cell in our body, there's a little bit of material that was produced by colliding neutron stars billions of years ago. Uh, each cell in our body, it turns out, has a little bit less than a milligram of gold. I don't think it has any particular biological importance. I think it's just there, but if there's a biologist, please correct me if I'm wrong. So this is one, I think, kind of remarkable inference from this particular event, but there's another one that in some ways is even more amazing which is I think it's not a complete exaggeration to say that the existence of life as we know it here on Earth owes itself in part to the fact that neutron star collisions happen and produce uranium. Uranium is important because it, it is a radioactive element that decays over billions of years. The decay of uranium in the interior of the Earth keeps the interior of the Earth hot that's part of what keeps the interior of the Earth boiling. The core of the Earth is actually undergoing boiling like a pot of water. That's what's responsible for plate tectonics. In California, we generally hate plate tectonics because plate tectonics is responsible for earthquakes. But plate tectonics is actually also responsible for life. Plate tectonics is what brings carbon from the interior to the surface of the Earth. If it weren't for plate tectonics constantly spewing carbon into the atmosphere by volcanoes, carbon would, on a relatively short time scale, be lost from the atmosphere of the Earth. And so that would remove, we think, a critical ingredient for life in terms of photosynthesis and ultimately sources of oxygen for respiration, et cetera. So at least life as it functions here on Earth uh, does actually rely critically on the existence of uranium in the core of the Earth, which owes its existence to colliding neutron stars billions of years ago. So I'll end there and take any questions you may have. Thanks. Yep. So the question is, are there more neutron stars in the past than there will be in the future? Um, I think there, are more, there will be more neutron stars in the future because stars are continuing to form. So the young stars are still being formed around us in the universe. And massive stars collapse to form neutron stars. So new neutron stars are constantly forming. And the rate at which new neutron stars form is faster than the rate at which neutron stars collide to become black holes or whatever way, other way neutron stars die. So there'll be more neutron stars in the future. 
Whether there'll be more collisions between neutron stars in the future is a little bit harder to know. We don't really understand very well, actually, um, the conditions under which two neutron stars or two black holes end up close enough to each other that in the age of the universe they spiral in and eventually collide. Most neutron stars will go around each other sort of forever and never get close enough to collide. So to answer the question of whether there'll be more neutron star mergers in the future, I actually suspect there were probably more in the past, but that's more uncertain. If our sun uh, became a neutron star, how would we be affected? Yeah, so thankfully we don't have to worry about that. Our sun will not become a neutron star, but our sun will be mean to us. Um, our sun will become a white dwarf. So in about four or five billion years, uh, the sun will expand up to become a giant. During that process, the Earth uh, will get incinerated. Um, and so everything as we know and love it here on Earth will be gone. It'll probably have been gone well before then. A billion years or so from now, the sun will be bright enough that all the water on the surface of the Earth will be boiled off. Uh, it may be boiled off before then, this thing called climate change. So uh, I'm not sure we have to worry about astronomy uh, for <laughs> bad events in the future. So imagine, though, that the Earth were going around not the sun, but a star that was more massive than the sun, um, a star that weighed, say, eight or ten times the mass of the sun. At the end of its life, it would collapse to form a neutron star. Uh, that collision, that, sorry, that collapse would produce an explosion that's called a supernova, and that would bathe the Earth in incredibly large amounts of radiation and energetic particles that would be uh, extraordinarily problematic for life on Earth that would kill off, would definitely kill off any life on planets around the neutron star. So, other question? Are there more black holes than uh, neutron stars or more neutron stars than black holes? So, are there more black holes than neutron stars or more neutron stars than black holes? There are more neutron stars than black holes. So, more massive stars collapse to form neutron stars than collapse to form black holes. Uh, and there are also, we think, more colliding neutron stars. Neutron stars collide more often with each other than black holes collide with each other. So. Um, is, has there ever been an instance of a trinary neutron star system? Has there ever been an instance of a triple neutron star system? No, there's not one known, but they should be out there. Many stars, uh, in fact, the closest star to us, again, not the sun, Proxima Centauri system is a triple system. So triple systems are actually not that uncommon. So it's almost certainly the case that there are triple neutron star and triple black hole systems. We just haven't discovered one yet. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Um, so this one? Yeah, um, or this one? Right next to okay, yeah. So I don't know the unit group, but yeah. the exponents there are kind of impressive. Yes. Um, so can you help me understand how big? Yeah. So this is the only, um, the only plot from an actual paper, um, and I showed it mostly for historical reasons. So an erg is related to a jewel which is related to, so watts, okay, light bulbs, a 100 watt light bulb is a certain amount of energy per second. So that's actually the same thing that's plotted here, energy per time. So one way to reframe this would be how many light bulbs is this equivalent to? That's a really big number, so I'm going to give you a different answer. Another way to think about this is how much brighter was this than the sun, okay? So right here at its peak, it was about 100 million times brighter than the sun. So that's how bright it was. Yep? I always get asked this. So the question is, why do the predicted values diverge from 
from the measured ones at lay time. So first of all, I should tell you that it is astonishing that the points are as close to the model uh, as they are. And the reason is that the elements that are created in this event are really hard to study in the lab. And there's a lot about how they produce and emit and absorb light that we don't know, and we just had to guess. Okay, So it's, I think, a bit of a coincidence that they're as close. So the answer of why they disagree here is because when we made the predictions, as I said, we didn't actually know a lot about the properties of the matter in this expanding radioactive debris cloud. And so we just assumed that the way that this matter emitted and absorbed light was similar to iron because iron has properties that we know and we've studied a lot in the lab and we've studied a lot in other explosions called supernovae. So these bumps are actually unique things associated with iron, uh, which shouldn't be in this event because this event didn't produce any iron. Okay. So we think there's information here that we're still trying to figure out exactly what it's telling us. It's probably telling us exactly how much yttrium was made and neodymium was made and all of that, but disentangling that is very much an active area of research still. Yep? Um, two questions. First is, how fast do gravitational waves move? So the first question is, how fast do gravitational waves move? So according to Einstein's theory of relativity, gravitational waves move at the speed of light. So it's a different type of wave than light but they also move at the same speed. And this particular event actually provided the best test of that prediction because we saw light and gravitational waves from the same event at basically the same time. And so we have a very, very strong constraint that the two speeds are incredibly similar to each other. I forget exactly how similar, but something like similar to each other to a part in a thousand trillion or something like that. So very, 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 very similar speeds. Yep. And my second question is, what happens to hydrogen during a neutron star merger? So the question is, what happens to hydrogen during a neutron star merger? So there really isn't ever any hydrogen around. Uh, the neutron star has neutrons and protons, but it's not in the form of a hydrogen atom. They're mostly neutrons and protons just flying around on sorry, neutrons, eh, protons and electrons, which are a hydrogen atom. But the protons and electrons aren't sort of close to each other, bound in an atom. They're sort of flying around, the protons and electrons. And so there, there isn't any hydrogen there. If there were any hydrogen there, what would happen is the temperatures and densities are so high that it would very quickly form heavier and heavier elements. So Hydrogen would combine to form helium, which is what's happening at the center of the sun. Helium would combine to form carbon and oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. And you'd end up again with gold and yttrium and all those good things. Just one more question. One more question? Yep. Is there, is there a sound associated with gravitational waves? So this is a pet peeve of mine. The question is, is there a sound associated with gravitational waves? So you will often see talks where people will play an audio clip of gravitational waves. Uh, there is not really a sound associated with gravitational waves. The reason that they do that is that the frequency, okay, the frequency of these waves what is the time it takes, the pattern of strong gravity, weak gravity, strong gravity, weak gravity? What is the time it takes that pattern to repeat itself, which is like a fraction of a second, a hundredth of a second, a thousandth of a second? That time is the same as the time it takes sound waves that we hear with our ear, the pattern of sound waves to repeat themselves. So the time between peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs, is similar to sound waves, but there's actually no sound associated with sound waves are waves that don't travel at the speed of light. They travel at the speed of sound, um, which is much slower than the speed of light. 
And sound waves require air or water or a star or they require some medium to go through. Okay. Uh, gravitational waves just go through empty space because they're really a property of space itself. So the similarity has to do with the time scale of the repeating pattern, not because there literally is a sound associated with it. Good question. Okay. Yep. One last. Oh, one Sorry. One get. Go ahead. So we now know that like, those heavy elements get produced by neutron stars or black holes. Does that mean that like lighter elements get possibly produced by mergers of less dense stars? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So, if the heaviest elements come from mergers of exotic things like neutron stars, do some of the other elements come from? mergers of, of less dense stars. So one of the leading models, I would say the leading model, for a certain type of exploding star, a supernova, which is an explosion of a white dwarf, one of the leading models of that is that it's produced by the collision of two white dwarfs. Very similar. White dwarfs are far apart. They spiral in as time goes on. They get closer and closer. They collide. In that case, though, when they collide, the collision generates a nuclear bomb, basically. The carbon in the white dwarf starts to fuse. That releases so much energy that the entire white dwarf gets blown apart. And we think those exploding white dwarfs are the dominant source of iron in the universe. So in that sense, yes, uh, less dense stars, white dwarfs in particular, um, uh, are actually an important colliding white dwarfs are probably a very important source of iron and related elements. Collisions between stars like the sun, two stars like the sun probably collide with each other not infrequently by astronomy standards, um, you know, meaning once every 100,000 or million years or something like that. Um, that probably does not get, that, not probably, that does not get hot enough to fuse heavier elements. So it does interesting things, but it doesn't produce new elements. Okay. Please thank our speaker, Dr. Elliot Quadert. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for sticking around. We're going to get started with the, uh, the expert Q&A panel. Um, our experts are diverse tonight, including our speaker. I'll just very quickly go through each of our, our, our uh, experts. Dylan Dong is a graduate student in the department, and he, uh, we take questions on any topic, but just as the specialties of the individuals who are on the panel, Dylan's comfortable uh, talking about explosions, star formation, and radio astronomy. We have Mia De Los Reyes, who's a graduate student in the department. Mia uh, will talk about origin of the elements, much like what we were hearing about tonight with Elliot, uh, galaxies and star formation, Luis Masribas is a postdoc in the department and at JPL, and he's writing Galaxies, Radiation, and Cosmology. Cosmology, the study of the universe as a whole. Uh, Elliot, our speaker tonight, uh, will talk about everything, so answer questions on everything. And I'm Cameron uh, Hummels. I'm happy to pick up what other people don't. Uh, no, I'm not everything. I'm small things. So I'll, I'll deal with the questions that, that don't, get, don't get handled elsewise. So um, just to start out, uh, what I wanted to see is if there were any questions from people who haven't. Sometimes we have some regulars, and that's great. But I don't want the regulars to dominate the question asking, at least for the first few questions. So if there are those of you who this is your first time, or maybe it's not your first time, but you've never a asked a question of our panel, I invite you to, to ask a question. So does anybody have, have any questions? Don't be self-conscious. We're here to answer you and your questions. Are you raising your hand? No, you weren't. You're adjusting your purse. Yes?
those heavy elements to be created and then for, an, let's call that an Earth-like planet, to have a chance of forming, what would be the earliest time for that, for something like that? So the question, just to make sure everybody can hear it in the back, is <clears throat> how early in the history of the universe would there be enough heavy elements um, including potentially uranium or things like that, but also just things like rocks, right? So silicates, uh, et cetera, iron in the Earth's core. For So how long would it take in the history of the universe until there's enough of those heavy elements for planets like the Earth to be able to form? I think there are some clues related to that from observations of planets around stars in our own galaxy, which are that planets around stars in our own galaxy are more common when the star has more heavy elements, when it has more of the heavy metals. So, and I think it seems hard to form planets if you have an amount of heavy elements, which is say 10 times less than what the sun has which probably means my guess would be that it actually would take um, a not insignificant amount of time, maybe a billion years or so, until there's enough heavy, el heavy elements built up that you could start to have an approval. Yeah, there's, you could have a decent, you know, it depends. There, even at that time, there'll be regions of the universe that are, unusual regions where many stars will have formed, there will have been many generations of supernovae. We do see, interestingly, we see very old stars that are in very low mass galaxies orbiting around our own that have these neutron rich heavy elements that I talked about, suggesting that something neutron star mergers, maybe something else, has already happened when the universe was actually relatively young, such that those elements are already in maybe not the first generation of stars, but a pretty early generation of stars. So I don't know if you want to add anything. I guess it's worth adding that this is one of, so, so Elliot's presentation was a great one on um, how neutron star mergers are considered potentially the dominant process for making these really heavy elements. But one of the problems is that with this model is that we do see these heavy elements very early. And then the question is, how do you get a neutron star merger that early in the universe? So Elliot also talked a bit about this, about how long it takes neutron stars to merge. And it takes a really long time in most cases. It's quite rare to actually get two neutron stars that are close enough to merge properly. So I think that's worth putting out there. Um, in terms of time, it, I think Elliot's right. It's pretty uncertain in part because there are, are multiple generations of stars and you can have those generations living at the start. Uh, in some parts you can have places that, of, in some parts of the universe, you can have places where there have already been multiple generations of star formation, but in other parts there, are, there hasn't been any star formation at all yet. And so the universe is just a mix of different kinds of places. Um, but it's maybe worth noting that the sun is what we call a population one star. Um, so then going backwards in time, the previous population is called a population two star. And we think that the first, very first generation of stars, we call these population three stars. I don't know why we named them in this direction, because now when there's a new generation of stars, I guess they'll be population zero. <laughs> and then we go into negative numbers. It's, it's very silly. They're also in Roman numerals. I don't even think the Romans knew about negative numbers. So, <laughs> um, so these population three stars, we don't know much about them at all. We don't know how long they lived. We suspect that they were extremely massive and that they lived for very, very short periods of time. But we have never directly observed one of these extremely old stars, and so we don't know. Why do you suspect they're so massive? Um, so this is because uh, they don't have any of these heavy elements. And so they burn through their material much more quickly, if that makes sense. I think maybe Elliot or Dylan can maybe take this, because he does star formation too. Uh, so one of the reasons why you might have uh, very, very massive stars when you have low amounts of heavy elements is that heavy elements uh, tend to catch the light. Uh, they, they catch the momentum from the light coming out of the star. And so if you have a lot of heavy elements, that sort of drives mass loss and winds coming out of the star. Uh, and so if a star is born with a certain amount of mass, especially at the very high mass end, uh, you often get the star blowing out like two thirds of its mass before like the end of its life. Um, whereas uh, if there's nothing to catch the light, 
then uh, it might retain all of that mass. Another reason is that, uh, and maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, conditions in the universe were also pretty different back then. And so it's thought that things were much hotter, so you know, maybe the, the cosmic microwave background is a little bit hotter, and so uh, the gas, if it's hot, uh, has a hard time actually collapsing to form stars. And so if you need, uh, if it's harder to actually collapse, then you actually need a lot more mass before uh, the gas cloud can collapse. And so uh, that might skew the population of stars to be a little bit more massive than typically what we see in the local universe. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, still encouraging anybody who uh, has never asked a question before? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I skipped over a lot of interesting work there. Yeah, the question was, how did they know where on the sky to look for the light associated with the gravitational waves from the colliding neutron stars? And the challenge, the challenge is that the gravitational wave telescopes don't do a great job of telling you where on the sky the event was. There is an analogy, you know, with your ears. If you just have your ears and you are listening to sound, it can be hard to pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. If you had 100 ears, that would look weird, but um, you could get much better directional information. So um, on the other hand, the gravitational waves do give you information not just about where on the sky it is, but how far away it was. So what people did, there's actually a couple of answers. I'll give one and then the other. So what people did, this is actually a technique that uh, Monsi Kazlal, who's here at Caltech, sort of initiated a number of years ago, was the idea that basically you look at all the galaxies that are in the right part of the sky, where LIGO said the gravitational waves come from, and are at the right distance, and you just look at all of them. And you see if one of them has a new source of light that goes up and down. And I forget, this, this is what groups did, and I think this was the third, it was the third or fourth galaxy on their list of big galaxies to look like in the right part of the sky at the right distance. Okay. Um, and it turned out, I think it's fair to say, that finding the light was way easier than anybody expected. And the reason was that this event was closer than we expected to see colliding neutron stars, which basically means we got lucky. Because it was closer, LIGO gave more precise information about where on the sky to look and what distances to look at. And so one actually could have detected the light from this colliding neutron stars with a large amateur telescope. The expectation had been that it would have taken some of the biggest telescopes uh, on Earth to detect the light coincident with colliding neutron stars. And that's just a reflection of this event ejected an amount of mass that was on the high end of what we expected, and we got lucky it was closer than we expected. Um, the other bit of the story about knowing where to look is that it turns out uh, about a second after the gravitational waves were detected, there was a flash of gamma rays. So those are light with a very short wavelength. And that telescope also provided some information about where to look, although it wasn't super useful. The most useful thing was just this technique of LIGO gives you some information. It turns out there was a European gravitational wave telescope that's called Virgo that was also looking. That provided additional information about where to look. 
And so that, plus this technique of looking at all the galaxies that are in the right place and the right distance, uh, actually was very effective. So. I think Dylan has a cool story about being on a telescope when this happened. Oh, yeah. So I've got two stories about this. So uh, this is huge news when it first came out. And it turns out that uh, this is actually very close to the time of the uh, solar eclipse. I don't know if you all remember that in 2017. So actually, my friends and I, like we're all grad students at Caltech, we were on our way driving up through like rural Utah, going into Wyoming, <laughs> trying to <laughs> go see the eclipse. And one of my friends, uh, Jake, he, he gets a call from Monsi, who's the person who, uh, his advisor, <laughs> who's the person who developed this galaxy search technique that El Elliot mentioned. And she was like, Jake, <laughs> it's an emergency. I need you to like do some work for me like and process all this data by tomorrow. <laughs> And you know, keep in mind that we're in a place that has like one bar of like reception, <laughs> and so poor Jake is like sitting in the back of our car. Uh, you know, our friend Denise is driving, and he's like trying to tether internet off of his like one bar of cell phone reception, like, and work on his laptop and connect to computers here at Caltech and try to process this data. Thankfully, um, he didn't actually need to get it done by the next day, um, and we were able to actually have our vacation and enjoy the eclipse. So that's the first story. <laughs> the second story is that I actually had a telescope run uh, like maybe a week afterwards. And this is on one of the biggest telescopes in the world in Hawaii. It's called the Keck Telescopes. Uh, and normally, you know, uh, optical astronomers measure how far something is from pointing straight up by this thing called air mass. Right? And you don't actually need to know what it is. But air mass, uh, basically, one is good. Uh, 1.5 is like, you know, around like maybe where you want to be. Two is like really pushing uh, how far down you want to go with your telescope. Uh, so Monty actually uh, requisitioned the first hour of our night to go observe this event. And it was at air mass five. And <laughs> this is like the lowest our telescope operator has ever seen anybody try to point this telescope. It was like close to the point where like you start getting mechanical failures and like it starts getting dangerous for the telescope. But this gives you a sense of, and this is like, you know, th this telescope is one of the most uh, expensive ones in like, <laughs> it, it's like a, a dollar per second or something like that in this telescope. And so uh, pointing at air mass five sort of tells you uh, how important this event was. So the question is, is there a way to forecast, say, the collision between two black holes or the collision of two neutron stars? Um, so by that, do you mean some observation that would tell you it's going to happen a week from now so you could know when and where to look? Yeah. Not, uh, not currently. However, there is, for instance, there are plans to build a telescope in space that will detect gravitational waves. Same basic technique, lasers bouncing back and forth, measure distances, measure distances between mirrors, measure gravitational waves that way. The difference is that these will not be a few miles apart, they'll be millions of miles apart in satellites orbiting on the Earth. And that will allow you to detect gravitational waves that have longer wavelengths, those gravitational waves are produced, for instance, when two black holes going around each other are further apart. So if that flies, that telescope will tell us in advance that there's two black holes orbiting around each other in that part of the sky, and we can tell you that so and so many months from now, those two black holes are going to collide with each other, so get ready, telescopes on the ground. 
That would be extremely cool. I think that's really the only feasible way that I've heard of to have advanced warning. Um, in principle, two neutron stars orbiting around each other, before the neutron stars collide, their magnetic fields start to run into each other. And you could, in principle, get some light from that. So you could imagine, in the future, if we understand this phenomena well enough, that maybe there's a certain light signal produced by neutron star collisions before they actually collide. Um, but I'm skeptical that that will actually ever work. That's the other, in principle, possibility, though, of how you might do it. So the question is, what's the upper limit on how far you can detect these collisions? The, so there are experimental limits, meaning there's experimental constraints. Um, so I'll, let's take LIGO for concreteness, what it is able to do. When the, say, black hole mergers are actually detected quite far away, billion light years or so away. So the one that, the one that I showed you the data from is quite far away. Um, as the telescope gets better and better, they'll be able to see them further and further away. At some point, the challenge will be that because of the expanding universe, the wavelength of the gravitational waves gets stretched. And that will move the signal into a part of wavelength space that LIGO is not as sensitive. So we would have trouble detecting, for that reason, colliding black holes from very, very, very distant. But I think, I think that uh, we'll be happy if we have that problem, because it means we will have detected them much further than we've already detected them. So in practice, as the, I mean, that's one of the things that's amazing about um, these measurements is that as the current, ex the current experiment, LIGO is getting better and better. So the expectation is that in five years, we won't have 10 colliding black holes. We'll plausibly have 1,000 colliding black holes. We won't have one colliding neutron star. We'll plausibly have you know, a dozen or 100 colliding neutron stars. Uh, and some of those colliding black holes will be quite a bit more distant, and so we'll, that'll start to tell us things about, you know, black hole formation at different ages in the history of the universe. So. Can you tell right now when the waves come in, if it's going to be two black holes or two Yeah, so the question is, can you actually tell that it's two colliding neutron stars versus two colliding black holes? And uh, what would you see in light if it's two colliding black holes? So actually, people have looked uh, at the black hole collisions to see if there's any light associated with it, and there hasn't been. And I think that's the expectation, is that there shouldn't be. There are some somewhat exotic scenarios. So for instance, um, imagine you had two black holes merging and there's another third star nearby that has a wind that's blowing some gas out. Maybe that could produce some light. I think that's very unlikely, but there are scenarios that so people have definitely looked. So the other question is, can you tell just from the gravitational waves whether it's colliding neutron stars or black holes? And I, I think the answer to that is, is actually yes and no in the following sense. So everything that LIGO has seen for the colliding neutron star is consistent with two objects that have no intrinsic size spiraling closer and closer to each other. The problem with neutron stars is that when they collide, the gravitational waves that they produce are actually at such high frequency that LIGO can't see it. 
So what LIGO sees is somewhat earlier in the collision when the two no neutron stars are sort of still spiraling around each other, getting closer and closer to each other. So in that sense, we don't really know that they're neutron stars. What we know they are is objects with masses of about 1.4 times the mass of the sun with very small sizes. And we don't know of any way to make a black hole like that. We know it can't be a white dwarf or a normal star. Neutron stars are the only things we know of that have those properties. In addition, the fact that it produced this light is consistent with it being neutron stars and not black holes. So sort of, I think everything hangs together really well that it's neutron stars. But if you want to be very precise about what LIGO alone could tell us, it could only say that there was some really small things orbiting around each other that collided, but it didn't actually measure the last phase of the collision itself because it wasn't sensitive to the gravitational waves that were emitted when it was that close. So. Any other questions? Sure. Can I ask one more question about the elements, elements heavy elements? Uh, yeah. So when the heavy elements are being formed, is there an upper limit to the type of heavy element that's being formed? So the question is if there's an upper limit to the mass of the elements that you could produce in a neutron star merger or something like it. And could you reach the, this theoretical island of stability, which is elements much heavier than anything that's been observed so far? I think it's not that much heavier, 125. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah, heavier than anything that's been observed so far. Um, and yes, is that, is, that, is that the question? Yes. Yeah, okay. So you're, yes, there is an upper limit. Uh, you're limited by the energy produced in this neutron star merger. Because in order for you to reach any islands of stability, you have to get over all of this instability first, and that t takes a lot of energy to fuse elements. I don't know, I can't think of numbers off the top of my head, and Elliot probably can, so I'm going to give this to Elliot. <laughs> so I guess the, the first thing to say is that some of the elements that we think were produced here don't exist stably in nature. So I mentioned, for obvious reasons, berkelium and californium. Those have been only created in laboratories on Earth uh, because they are all unstable. Now, some of them have half-lives of uh, tens or hundreds of millions of years, so they can be around for a while, but not long enough that they sort of exist in random parts of the universe. Um, what happens as you build up heavier and heavier elements is that they tend to they tend to break apart by fission into lighter elements so the way you actually build up the heavy elements in this kind of situation is neutrons sort of bombard other things that are around and you build up heavier and heavier elements that way and the problem with building yet heavier elements is that things start to fission and break apart spitting out helium or breaking in half or things like that. So, so I was curious about the same thing, so I've asked nuclear physics colleagues this question. And the, I, the answer I've had, heard, is that it's uncertain because we don't understand the nuclear physics of these heavy nuclei very well. And so whether or not you could actually make things um, in this hypothesized island of stability depends on nuclear physics ingredients in the models. So I have not gotten a straight 
yes or no answer. I've gotten it. It depends on some of the physics, you know, meaning that I think it's possible, but it, it really does depend on some of the nuclear physics that's not very certain. So. Uh, the, uh, lighter, the lighter element that you mentioned in the presentation, uh, lithium, hydrogen, and all that, you said form in the beginning of the universe. Uh, do they not form in, uh, through other methods, like the, they will be in the beginning of the universe and that's it? So the question is, some of the lighter elements like lithium, beryllium, boron, uh, Elliot, in, in your presentation you mentioned, right, that these formed during the Big Bang. Are there other, me your question is, are there other mechanisms yeah. other than in the early universe that you can form some of these light elements? Yeah. Uh, it's my understanding, and I can be corrected by my colleagues, uh, that there are some low efficiency mechanisms that can create these elements, primarily through the, the bombardment of light elements with high energy protons, um, high energy protons like the solar wind. So uh, our sun and many other stars have, have uh, particles flying off the surface, what we call the solar wind. I don't think that's energetic enough to cause lithium, though, is it? It's, is it cosmic ray bombardment? Okay. So, um, so solar wind causes particles to fly off at a pretty decent speed, but um, in more exotic events like supernovae, you can really propel uh, protons at much, much higher velocities, very, very close to the speed of light. And these go flying through the universe, uh, and basically when they run into other objects, they'll fuse with them. Uh, and and you, can, you can build up these light elements. But as I said, it's not a very efficient mechanism. So the bulk of those elements, I believe, are all caused in the very, very early universe. But now I'm going to get corrected by my colleagues. So the elements that are made in the Big Bang are thought to be hydrogen, helium, and lithium. And helium is actually produced very commonly in stars. So this is what is powering the sun right now, is the, uh, the fusion of hydrogen into helium. So he helium is produced, yeah, pretty, pretty easily. Yeah. Lithium is much harder to make and yeah. is often destroyed. It is made, it's, but it's in stars especially, it's primarily destroyed. Yeah. So the elements that are observed that give us constraints on what the universe was like a few minutes after the Big Bang are how much hydrogen there is, how much helium there is, and helium comes in a couple of flavors. There's normal helium with two protons and two neutrons. There's also what's called an isotope of helium, which has two protons and one neutron. There's lithium. There's what's called deuterium, which is hydrogen with a proton and a neutron. So we have actually a variety of these different light elements, and the amount of all of them is consistent with the predictions of the Big Bang model for what was going on a few minutes after the Big Bang. So. And, the, um, and in doing that comparison, the, the kind of question you raised of, well, can't these elements be produced in other ways has always historically been a big worry. Because if you can create or destroy these elements, then they're not very good probes of what was happening in the early universe if their amount of them has changed a lot in the last 13.7 billion years. So people have worried about this a lot, and I think, um, you know, with the ex helium is the most obvious, helium-4 is the most obvious problematic one, um, but all of the others I think we understand reasonably well are, are not produced or destroyed uh, in great abundance, at least out in sort of random places in the universe. They can be deep in stars, but not in random gas clouds out in the universe. And now we'll make sure that the regulars who we kind of barred from asking questions initially are included and invited to also ask questions. Don't want to be exclusive here. Yes? Yeah, before the discovery of neutron stars and neutron star mergers, was the super model, uh, supernova model the only explanation that scientists had for the creation of the elements? Before the merging neutron star model was uh, 
were supernovae, like core collapse supernovae, the, the only mechanism that w physicists had for the creation of heavy elements? That's the question. It's your origin of the elements. So there is another way to make elements much heavier than iron. Not much heavier than iron. Um, and this is what's called the S process. So Elliot talked today about the R process, which is when you just take a, an element and you bombard it with neutrons really fast. This is called the rapid or R neutron process. The S process stands for slow neutron process. So instead of bombarding things with neutrons really fast, you bombard them with neutrons really slowly. And so th through this me mechanism, you can make a different set of heavy elements. Um, and these include things like barium, which is still a pretty heavy element, but not as heavy as some of the stuff you can make through the R process. Um, I'm blanking on other things. Barium is the one I know off the top of my head. So we'll go with that one. <laughs> um, and this is the S process, which produces things like barium, is predominantly, well, one of the, one, what's thought to be the dominant mechanism for producing S process elements is what's called stellar winds from asymptotic giant branch stars, or AGB stars. Um, and these are stars that are much bigger than the sun and are in, at a much later stage of their evolution than the sun. We don't need to go into details, but because they're so much bigger and heavier, they produce, uh, Dylan described that, they, that massive stars can lose a lot of their mass in these stellar winds, and these winds might be, the, might be one way to produce these S process elements. The reason I ask Yes, that is true. Oh, should I repeat the question? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Can you rep repeat the question again? Because I. Do you want to take? Uh, well, the question was: uh, are, are gold, platinum, and other heavy elements like that now mostly attributed to neutron star mergers? And yeah, as Elliot said in his talk, uh, we think from this one event, if you extrapolate to like uh, the very uncertain rates of uh, how often neutron star mergers. Uh, occur, uh, we think that yes, it's definitely possible to produce all the observed gold, platinum, and whatnot in these sorts of events. And models, models of, of exploding massive stars, supernovae, have over time become less and less able to produce neutron rich R process elements. The physical conditions just aren't quite right in the models. So th that doesn't, there could be an unusual rare type of massive star explosion. For instance, imagine that 1% of massive stars when they die explode in some weird way that we don't fully understand yet. That's totally possible. Those could still be an interesting non-negligible source of these neutron rich heavy elements. So I think it's clear that neutron star mergers can do it. I think it, it will be a, you know, it'll probably be settled in the next five or six years exactly how often neutron star mergers happen and how much material they eject. So we'll understand their contribution much better as the measurements get better. Any other questions? Okay, uh, the question is for each of the panelists or us as a whole, I imagine each of the panelists, uh, what's the area of research that we find the most interesting? Is that correct? Or discovery. Or discovery that's the most interesting. Or... Okay, start at this end. <laughs> uh, that's a really tough question. So uh, they're actually scientists at many stages of their career here, all the way from graduate students to professors. And so Elliot has worked on like 10 million different things. <laughs> and I'm really curious to hear his answer. Uh, for me, I've really just worked on uh, two fields. Um, one is star formation. So I've used radio telescopes to measure how fast stars form. 
And uh, in particular, radio telescopes are really good at, at cutting right through the dust that happens to exist in the star-forming regions uh, that blocks the light from many other ways that uh, people use to use measure star formation rates. So that's one thing that I've done. Uh, another thing that I currently work on is using radio telescopes to find explosions of various kinds. Uh, and if I had to choose between the two, I mean, I'm interested in both. <laughs> I know it's a cop-out, but uh, yeah, okay. Well, if I, if I really, really needed to uh, choose between the two, I think, I think explosions are a little bit more fun <laughs> than star formation. Yeah. So what I'm working on right now, so, okay. We have talked a lot about the origin of elements, and in particular what I study is one element called manganese. I am a manganese of manganese, if you will. And the reason we care about manganese is because we think that, so Elliot mentioned that iron seems to be predominantly produced in one kind of supernova explosion called a type 1a supernova. And these two type 1a supernovae are really important for a lot of things. So they were used in the Nobel Prize winning discovery that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. They're used as sort of cosmic signposts, light posts, I guess, because we think that they all have the type 1a supernovae, some of them have a pretty standard brightness. And so you can use that to measure how far out things are in the universe. The problem with type 1a supernovae is that we don't actually know how they explode. So Ellie mentioned that the, one of the leading models now is that you have two white dwarfs that merge together, and then you get a, a nuclear bomb, basically. But we don't know if this is the dominant mechanism or if there's so traditionally it was thought that it was actually just one white dwarf that reached a certain mass and then it couldn't sustain itself anymore and just exploded and so there's a lot of debate about what exactly these explosions are and i mean it's really important because we use them in, all, in as these distance measurements so it's you know important to understand the physics behind them and we really don't know that much and so what i do is i use manganese because it turns out that these type 1a supernovae will uh, the most massive white dwarfs if they explode will produce a lot of manganese, but less massive white dwarfs will produce less manganese. And so by measuring the amount of manganese in stars now, the goal is to figure out something about the kinds of white dwarfs that exploded in these type 1a supernovae. And I think that's really cool. And when, so it, this is interesting too, because it's a very, it's sort of a different way of approaching the problem than I think a lot of other people studying these type 1a supernovae have done. It's something sort of called galactic archeology span is what we like to call it, because we're looking at what conditions were like in galaxies when stars formed in the past. Because we think that the stars that exist now, the, their chemical composition is reflective what the conditions in the galaxy were like when they formed. So we're looking back in the past and figuring out what the, like how the amount of manganese has changed over time in a galaxy. And so this can give us a handle on what kind of supernovae produced all this manganese. So I think that's really cool. Like we're actually you know, we're able to answer a question in a very different way than I think most other people have done. So I think that's cool as heck. <laughs> Luis needs more time. You asked a very difficult question. Uh, yeah, I've been racking my brain because there's a lot of areas that I find very interesting as well. I think the, the answer I'm going to settle on is something that's perplexing to the field right now, something called FRBs, fast radio bursts. It's a discovery that happened in the last few years of some distant explosion, although we have a difficult time localizing it, like black hole, uh, black hole mergers with gravitational waves, although a different source. But we have, we have very difficult uh, ability to localize it in a particular region on the sky, but we see this millisecond burst of radio waves that hit us, and we're like, what was that? What was that? And um, then we'll see another one over here or something like that. And we're trying to figure out more about what's causing that burst, what's responsible for it, uh, and also where, where these exist. It appears, if you kind of extrapolate on the number that we've seen and when we've been sensitive to them, that these things are happening all the time, like a thousand times a day in different parts of the universe. But we've only detected 20 or so FRBs. Oh, did, did that change in the, from Chime? Okay. Okay, so... There, yeah. So there was a New York Times article about these things at the beginning of January. Uh, there's a new detector in 
put together by uh, Canada. Called, yeah, all of Canada put this thing together. <laughs> called Chime. And yeah, in the last week, they just revealed a bunch more uh, detections of these things. Because now we're building instruments that are more sensitive and to be able to find these. But really, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the mechanism, what's actually going on that can cause this, this burst. Is it, is it beamed at us or is it, just, is it traveling in all directions? Like what's, what's going on that causes this energetic, very short-lived explosion uh, that only appears, seems to appear in the radio waves and not the visible part of the spectrum or gamma rays or anything like that. So I think this is very interesting. It also can provide a bunch of different probes of potentially uh, galactic structure or cosmological structure that could be really useful for discerning some other things that are unrelated to the mechanism that's generating the explosion. But it's very exciting. So I encourage you to look up FRBs or, or something like that, fast radio bursts. The New York Times article is pretty good. But, uh, or look up about this discovery in the last, uh, this announcement in the last week. Let's see, I think gravitational waves are cool, as you can tell. Um, I would say one other area in general that is and will be particularly interesting, there's a telescope that's called the Event Horizon Telescope. What it really is, is using a collection of telescopes across the Earth uh, in this technique that's called interferometry, where you combine the signals from different telescopes to get better images of what astronomical sources look like. So in this case, it's literally combining telescopes across the entire Earth uh, at radio wavelengths to look at the gas that's spiraling into the event horizon of a couple of nearby black holes at the centers of galaxies. And by a couple, I mean two. Um, so this is the first time we have lots of evidence for black holes in astronomy, including gravitational wave detections. But all of that information, there's no spatial information. It's a point on the sky. It might vary in time, but we can't see any spatial structure because it's too small on the sky for us to take a picture of what it actually looks like. Now we will be able to do that. We'll actually be able to have an image, which will be sort of like the one in interstellar, but better. Um, of what gas spiraling into a black hole actually looks like. So this is, for instance, um, one of the areas that my students and I are doing a lot of theoretical modeling and predictions is to try to understand how gas spirals into a black hole, how it emits light, how that light gets bent by the strong gravity of the black hole, what it would actually look like to a distant observer, things like that. So I think the, the initial results from this telescope will come out, I'm told, in early April, I believe. So I'm sure there will be uh, some press releases and inter interesting announcements around that time. So um, I'm still not sure what to answer. So I, go, I work a little bit on these things, but um, my general answer would be that what I find more, more interesting or most interesting is the things that I don't know yet. So a, a little bit the way I try to work, which you could call a career suicide, it's a bit like if at some point I have an idea of something that it's not very clear, I like to follow that idea and see up to at which point that makes sense and I can continue investigating a bit more on that or I just quit and go on another direction. I know that's a very vague answer, but uh, it's, a, it's a very much what it is. So I try to do a bit like this, always constrain that I have to produce something that my boss is happy with, um, so I cannot go to anything. Um, but I think I'm gonna stick with this answer. He's honest. Uh, we probably have time for one or two questions. Oh, yeah, that's right, we did. Oh, okay. So the question is, 
if it weren't in fact cloudy tonight and we had the telescope set up, what is it that we'd be looking at in the sky tonight? Mm -hmm. if, it's, if, it's a good day. if it's a if it's a clear night, we'll pretend we'll even go so far as to say we're not in Pasadena. We're, you know, a hundred miles north in the dark in uh, in the Central Valley with no houses around, no lights around. Um, okay, so this time of the year, I think the best targets, so first of all, in general, we plan our public lectures to coincide with the lunar cycle, so when the first quarter moon is up. So the moon goes through, obviously, different lunar cycles when you see different shapes and so on and so forth, and that means that the moon rises and sets at different times, and first quarter moon means it rises at about noon and sets at about midnight, which means it's pretty well overhead when we have these events. And it's about half illuminated. It's called first quarter because it's the first quarter of its 28-day, roughly 28-day cycle. Unfortunately, tonight we're out of phase, so we're in the third quarter moon, so the moon rises at about midnight and sets at about noon, so it's not yet up. So we, in some ways that's better because it means the sky is darker. You don't have this bright moon shining down on you. Uh, screwing up your night vision and kind of increasing the surface brightness of the, of the atmosphere. But it means you don't have a great target of the moon. Um, planets that are up right now... I think Uranus is up. It's very difficult to see from here in, because of light pollution here in Los Angeles. I say Uranus, I, I don't say Uranus, which is usually what uh, English speakers will say. But actually Uranus is, is generally, I don't know, that, that's what I've always learned. You're the professor. Um, anyway, uh, it's visible, but it would be challenging with the telescopes that we have to see it. When you can see it, you could see it probably with a 12-inch diameter a or aperture telescope, which is only slightly bigger than what we use here uh, if we were in much darker conditions. It has a nice kind of bluish, light bluish tint to it. It's, it's really pretty. Um, we would probably look at the Orion Nebula, which is amongst, I think, the most beautiful objects in the sky. It's usually pretty easy to see. The Orion Nebula is a cloud of gas that is, um, is collapsing under its own gravity, and it's starting to form stars. And some of those stars are, are quite young by star ages. They're millions of years old. And the brightest and most massive of those are in the center, there are four of them, and their shape on the sky makes a little trapezoid, so they're called the trapezium stars, and they're pumping out so much energy and light that they're, uh, they're heating up and ionizing a bunch of the gas around it, and it's causing that gas to fluoresce, and we can see the light. It, it basically illuminates its birth cloud, and it's really, really beautiful, so I encourage you to check out images on the, uh, on the internet. Uh, the Pleiades are also visible, which is a, a, a cluster of stars that's at a slightly older age of evolution than that, that Orion Nebula is, um, but they're also very beautiful. You probably are familiar with them because the Japanese car company Subaru, their insignia is the, is the Pleiades because it's the Japanese name for that same object. Um, there's also the double cluster, which is a, yeah, Subaru. Yes, yeah, so Subaru is the Pleiades, Pleiades are from Greek mythology and, and, and Greek civilization, whereas Subaru is from Japanese. So Pleiades, meaning like seven sisters. Um, I don't know what Subaru means. Probably a similar thing. Maybe not seven sisters. but um, And then the double cluster, which are two star clusters, kind of like uh, the Pleiades that happen to be um, projected close to each other on the sky. I don't actually know if they're gravitationally bound. Do you guys know? I, don't, I think they're projected to be on the sky. So they're right next to each other. That's really pretty. Um, you need a relatively large field of view to see both of them, though, because they're kind of spread out. Each is about like the size of the moon, size of the full moon in projection on the sky. Um, that's a handful of things. There's a really cool thing called the ET nebula, or ET cluster that kind of looks like ET, like the alien. It's also called the owl, owl cluster. Oh, it's super cool. It's right next to um, Cassiopeia. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, so that's probably what we'd look at tonight. But obviously it changes over the course of the year because you, you see different parts of the sky at different parts of the, the year as the Earth goes in its orbit around the sun. We can, we can see different sections of the, of the sky. But I like the early spring. I think there's some really good targets. Although this summer there's lots of planets visible. So stay tuned. You'll be able to see you know, uh, Venus and Jupiter and Saturn, which are 
incredible. Yeah, sorry, that was very long-winded. I'm long-winded. Uh, we could probably take one more question if there's a question from the audience. Yeah. Is there anything that can prematurely stop a black hole? I don't know if like two black holes colliding or anything at all. Stop? What do you mean by like stop? Kind of destroy a black hole. Okay. The question is, is there anything that can destroy or stop a black hole? Do you want to... Yes. <laughs> that's, that's my answer. Thank you. No. Uh, so, um, I'm not sure whether there is something that can destroy a black hole, but the black hole itself ends at some point. And you know there is this region around the black hole called the uh, event horizon. So if you go closer to the center of the black hole than the event horizon, you never come back. So you fall in. Anything can escape after this point. Is the event horizon, am I right? Yes, okay. Uh, not even light, so that's why it's called black hole. However, uh, so everything that falls into the black hole contributes to increase the mass, the mass of the black hole and make it bigger. So this would just mean that with time the black hole goes big, 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 and that's it, and stays there forever. But there is something called Hawking radiation, which is that the black hole emits some kind of radiation, some kind of light, and through this process is releasing energy, which would be equivalent to mass. So actually, even if the black hole is not accreting anything or when it's not increasing mass, actually its mass is being reduced by this effect. And you could ask, but how is, pos how is that possible if you said that nothing can escape a black hole? The answer is even more weird, and it's the following. So where you have nothing, you can produce things. If you imagine this as you have a zero, and you can build your zero, putting together a one and a minus one. Do you agree? Okay. So if you do one minus one, you get a zero. So from two things, you can create a nothing. But you can invert this process, and from your zero, where you have nothing, something can pop out in the form of a one, so you create something, um, as long as you create something else that compensates that thing. So you can create a one and a minus one. The Hawking radiation is exactly this thing. So you have a black hole, and really close to the event horizon, you create, create a particle and an antiparticle that both together eliminate, and they are nothing. So that's completely fine, because you got nothing, in, you had nothing in the end, so still, in total, you have nothing. But now, one of these particles falls into the black hole, everything is fine, but the other just escapes away. So you can imagine how rare this is and how no often this happens. But if you have a black hole over, over, over millions of years, in this way, just because something falls in back and then something goes away, in this way, uh, you emit this radiation, this Hawking radiation, and this is how the black hole ends up. So the black hole ends up being nothing. If you want, the black hole evaporates. That's how we call it. So the black hole is not infinite life. If you continue with this kind of question, yes. I'm not sure I can <laughs> keep going, but please go ahead. Follow the question to that question. But it takes a very, very, very long time to evaporate a black hole that's, that's of any kind of mass. Have we detected the Hawking radiation? I don't believe that anyone has ever detected Hawking radiation. I think the signal would be very, 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 very slight. Um, what kind of signal would you... Yeah, exactly. You'd, you'd expect to see small amounts of, of, of particles traveling out. It's actually a, a variety of particles that come out. So people have looked, if you take a, I think I have this right, a comet mass black hole, it evaporates in about the age of the universe, and the, there are arguments that it would produce a flash of gamma rays. So people have looked for this kind of thing um, to no avail. All right. It's 9 o'clock. 
Uh, thank you very much for everyone sticking around and, and as I said, braving the poor weather conditions. Uh, we'll have an event in two weeks. Dr. Mike Brown will be speaking and we'll have hopefully better weather allow us to observe some of the things that we talked about and have another Q&A panel. Uh, but yeah, thanks everyone for coming.